Hello and welcome back. We're gonna start in the middle of chapter seven where we left off um, two days ago. Here we go. <clears throat> the next time the water truck came, it was driven by Mr. Pendanski, who also bought sack, brought sack lunches. Stanley sat with his back against a pile of dirt and ate. He ate a bologna sandwich, potato chips, and a large chocolate chip cookie. How you doing? asked Magnet. Not real good, said Stanley. Well, the first hole's the hardest, said Magnet. Stanley took a long, deep breath. He couldn't afford to dawdle. He was way behind on the others, and the sun was just getting hotter. It wasn't even noon yet. He didn't know if he had the strength to stand up. He thought about quitting. He wondered what would they do to him? What could they do to him? His clothes were soaked with sweat. In school, he had learned that sweating was good for you. It was nature's way of keeping you cool. So why was he so hot? <clears throat> Using a shovel for support, he managed to get to his feet. Where are we supposed to go to the bathroom? He asked Magnet. Magnet gestured with his arm to a great expanse around them. Pick a hole, any hole, he said. Stanley staggered across the lake, almost falling over in the dirt. Behind him, he heard Magnet say, but make sure nothing's living in it. After leaving Myra's house, Elia wandered aimlessly through the town until he found himself down by the wharf. He sat on the edge of the pier and stared down into the cold black water. He could not understand how Myra had, had trouble deciding between him and Igor. He thought she loved him. Even if she didn't love him, couldn't she see what a foul person Igor was? It was like Madame Zeroni had said. Her head was an empty like a flower pot. Some men were gathering around the dock, and he went to see what was going on. A sign read, Deck hands wanted, free passage to America. He had no sailing experience, but the ship's captain signed him aboard. The captain could see that Elia was a man of great strength. Not everybody could carry a full-grown pig up the side of the mountain. It wasn't until the ship had cleared the harbor and was heading out across the Atlantic when he suddenly remembered his promise to car carry Madame Zeroni up the mountain. He felt terrible. He wasn't afraid of the curse. He thought that it was a lot of nonsense. He felt bad because he knew Madame Zeroni had wanted to drink the stream before she died. <clears throat> Zero was the smallest kid in Group D, but he was the first one to finish digging. You're finished? Stanley asked enviously. Zero said nothing. Stanley walked to Zero's hold and watched him measure it with his shovel. The top of his hole was a perfect circle. The sides were smooth and steep. Not one dirt clod more than necessary had been removed from the earth. Zero pulled himself up to the surface. He didn't even smile. He looked down at his perfectly dug hole, spat in it, and then turned and headed back to camp co compound. Zero's one weird dude, said Zigzag. <clears throat> Stanley would have laughed, but he didn't have the strength. Zigzag had to be the weirdest dude Stanley had ever seen. He had a long skinny neck, a big round head with wild frizzy blonde hair that stuck out in all directions. His head seemed to bob up and down on his neck like it was on a spring. Armpit was one of the second was the second one to finish digging. He also spat into his hole before heading back to camp compound. One by one, Stanley watched each of the boys spit into their hole and return to the camp compound. Stanley kept digging. His hole was almost up to his shoulders. Although it was hard to tell exactly where ground level was because his dirt pile completely surrounded the hole, the deeper he got, the harder it was to raise the dirt up out of the hole. Once again, he realized he was going to have to move the piles. His cap was stained with blood from his hands. He felt like his dig he was digging his own grave. In America, Elia learned to speak English. He fell in love with a woman named Sarah Miller. She could push a plow, milk a goat, and most important, think for herself. She and Elia often stayed up half the night talking and laughing together. Their life was not easy. Elia worked hard, but bad luck seemed to follow him were everywhere. Hmm. He's always seemed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He remembered Madame Zeroni telling him that she had a son in America. Elia was, looking, or was forever looking for him. He'd walk up to complete stranger, strangers and ask if they knew someone named Zeroni or had ever heard of anyone named Zeroni. No one did. Elia wasn't sure what he'd ever do if he found Madame Zeroni's son anyway, carry him up a mountain and sing the pig lullaby to him. After his barn was struck by lightning for the third time, he told Sarah about his broken promise to Madame Zeroni. I'm worse than a pig thief, he said. 
You should leave me and find someone who isn't cursed. I'm not leaving you, said Sarah, but I want you to do one thing for me. Anything, said Elia. Sarah smiled. Sing me the pig lullaby. He sang it for her. Her eyes sparkled. That's so pretty. What does it mean? Elia tried his best to translate from Latvian to English, but it wasn't the same. It rhymes in Latvian, he told her. I could tell, said Sarah. A year later, their child was born. Sarah named him Stanley because she noticed that Stanley was Yelnats spelled backwards. Sarah changed the words from the pig lullaby so they rhymed and every night she sang it to little Stanley. If only, if only the woodpecker sighs, the bark on the tree was as soft as the skies, while the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, crying to the moon, if only, if only. Stanley's hole was as deep as his shovel, but not quite wide enough at the bottom. He grimaced as he sliced off a chunk of dirt, then raised it up and flung it onto the pile. He laid his shovel back down on the side of his hole, and to his surprise, it fit. He rotated it and only had to chip off a few more chunks of dirt here and there before he could, lay, he could lie flat across his hole, his hole in every direction. He heard the water truck approaching and felt a strange sense of pride of being able to show Mr. Sir or Mr. Pendansky that he had dug his first hole. He put his hands on the rim and tried to pull himself up, but he couldn't do it. His arms were too weak to lift his heavy body. He used his legs to help, but he just didn't have any strength. He was trapped in his hole. It was almost funny, but he wasn't in the mood to laugh. Stanley, he heard Mr. Pendancy call. Using his shovel, he dug two footholes in the wall, hole wall and climbed up to see Mr. Pendansky walking over to him. I was afraid you fainted, said Mr. Pendansky. You wouldn't have been the first. I'm finished, said Stanley said, putting his blood-spotted cap on his head. All right, said Mr. Pendansky, raising his hand for a high five, but Stanley ignored it. He didn't have the strength. Mr. Pendansky lowered his hand and looked back down at Stanley. Well done, he said. You want to ride back? Stanley shook his head. I'll walk. Mr. Pendansky climbed back onto the truck without filling Stanley's canteen. Stanley waited for him to drive away, then took another look at his hole. He knew it was nothing to be proud of, but he felt proud nonetheless. He sucked up the last bit of saliva and spat. We'll read chapter eight. Chapter eight. A lot of people don't believe in curses. A lot of people don't believe in yellow spotted lizards either. But if one bites you, it doesn't make a difference whether you believe in it or not. Actually, it kind of, it is kind of odd that scientists name the lizard after its yellow spots. Each lizard has exactly 11 yellow spots but the spots are so hard to see on its yellow green body. The lizard is from six to 10 inches long and has red eyes. In truth, it, its eyes are yellow, but the skin around its eyes is, which is red. But everyone always speaks of its red eyes. It also has black teeth and a milky white tongue. Looking at you, you would have, or looking at one, you would have thought it should have been named a red-eyed li lizard or black tooth lizard, perhaps a white-tongued lizard. If ever you'd be close enough to see the yellow spots, you're probably dead. The yellow-spotted lizards like to live in holes, which offer shade from the sun and protection from predatory birds. Up to 20 lizards may live in one hole. They have strong, powerful legs and can leap out of very deep holes to attack their prey. They eat small animals, insects, certain cactus thorns, and shells of sunflower seeds. All right, we'll read one more today, chapter nine. Stanley stood in the shower and let the cold water pour down his hot and sore back. It was four minutes of heaven. For the second day in a row, he didn't use soap. He was too tired. There was no roof over the shower building and the walls were raised up six inches off the floor, except in the corners. There was no drain in the floor. The water ran out under the walls and evaporated quickly in the sun. He put on his clean set of orange clothes. He returned to his tent and put his dirty clothes in the crate and got out his pen and box of stationery and headed to the rec room. A door above the sign said rec room, W-R-E-C-K. Nearly everything in the room was broken. The TV, the pinball machine, the furniture. Even the people looked broken with their worn out bodies sprawled over the various sofas and chairs. 
X-ray and armpit were playing pool. The surface of the table reminded Stanley of the surface of the lake. It was full of bumps and holes because so many people had carved their initials into the felt. There was a hole in the far wall and an electric fan that had been placed in front of it. Cheap air conditioning, but at least the fan worked. As Stanley made his way across the room, he tripped over an outstretched leg. Hey, watch it, said the orange lump in the chair. You watch it, muttered Stanley, too tired to care. What did you say, the lump demanded. Nothing, said Stanley. The lump rose. He was almost as big as Stanley and a lot tougher. You said something. He poked his fat finger into Stanley's neck. What'd you say? A crowd quickly formed around them. Be cool, said X-Ray. He put his hand on Stanley's shoulder. You don't want to mess with the caveman, he warned. The caveman's cool, said Armpit. I'm not looking for trouble, said Stanley. I'm just tired, that's all. The lump grunted. X-Ray and Armpit led Stanley over to the couch. Squid slid over to make room as Stanley sat down. Did you see the caveman back there? Asked X-Ray. The caveman's one tough dude, said Squid, and he lightly punched Stanley's arm. Stanley leaned back against the torn vinyl upholstery. Despite his shower, his body still radiated heat. I wasn't trying to start anything, he said. The last thing he wanted to do after killing himself all day in the lake was get into a fight with the boy, with the boy called the caveman. He was glad X-Ray and Armpit came to his rescue. Well, how'd you like your first hole, asked Squid. Stanley groaned and the other boys laughed. Well, the first hole's the hardest, said Stanley. No way, said X-Ray. The second hole's a lot harder. You're hurting before you even get started. If you think you're sore now, just wait and see how you feel tomorrow morning, right? That's right, said Squid. Plus the fun's gone, said X-Ray. The fun, said Stanley. Don't lie to me, said X-Ray. I bet you always wanted to big a, dig a big hole, right? Am I right? Stanley had never really thought about it before, but he knew better than to tell X-Ray that he wasn't right. Every single kid in the world wants to dig a big hole, a great big hole, he said, to China, right? Right, said Stanley. See what I mean, said X-Ray? That's what I'm saying. But now the fun's gone and you still gotta do it again, and again, and again. Camp fun and game, said Stanley. <laughs> What's in the box, said Squid. Stanley had forgotten he had brought it. Uh, paper. I was going to write a letter to my mother. Your mother, laughed Squid. She'll worry if I don't, Squid scowled. Stanley looked around the room. This was the one place in camp where the boys thought they could enjoy themselves. And what'd they do? They wrecked it. The glass on the TV was smashed as if someone had put his foot through it. Every table and chair seemed to be missing, at least one leg, everything leaned. He waited to write the letter until after Squid had gotten up and joined a game of pool. Dear Mom, today was my first day at camp and I already made some friends. We've been out on the lake all day, so I'm pretty tired. Once I pass the swimming test, I'll learn how to water ski. I, he stopped writing as he became aware that somebody was reading over his shoulder. He turned to see Zero standing behind the couch. I don't want her to worry about me, he explained. Zero said nothing. He just stared at the letter with a serious, almost angry look on his face. Stanley slipped it back into the stationery box. Did the shoes have red X's on the back? Zero asked. It took Stanley a moment, but then he realized that Zero was talking about Clyde Livingston shoes. Um, yes, they did. He wondered how Zero knew that. Brand X was a popular brand of sneakers. Maybe Clyde Livingston had made a commercial for them. Zero stared at him for a moment with the same intensity with which he had been staring at the letter. Stanley poked his finger through <clears throat> a hole in the vinyl couch and pulled out some of the stuffing. He wasn't aware what he was doing. Come on, caveman, dinner, said Armpit. You coming, caveman, said Squid. Stanley looked around to see that Armpit and Squid were talking to him. Um, sure, he said. He put the piece of stationery back in the box, then got up and followed the boys to, to the tables. The lump wasn't caveman. He was. He shrugged his left shoulder. It was better than barf bag. All right. And that's all we'll read today. I'll check in again tomorrow. Bye.